everybody. Um, on the 9th of May in 2013, the atmospheric composition passed a very important threshold. For the first time in 15 million years, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere went above 400 parts per million. So to put this into a context, I think it's worthwhile thinking about our timeline, the human evolutionary timeline. The, passing this threshold of 400 parts per million, this is the first time ever in the entire evolutionary history of Homo sapiens, our species. In actual fact, it's the first time ever in the entire evolutionary history of Homo, our genus. And you could almost push it to the entire evolutionary history of the family to which we belong, the great apes. So this was a, a really important time, and it was just last month, just one month before the, this TEDx event. So we could ask, well, what is the big deal about this little molecule? 400 parts per million, this may not be familiar to many in the audience. We could convert it into a more familiar unit, like percent. So 400 parts per million is a mere 0.04%. So it's an absolutely minuscule portion of the atmospheric composition. If we compare it to oxygen, it's about 21%. Or nitrogen gas, it's about 70%. So why is it that this tiny little molecule is featured in the press? Why is it debated in all of the world's climate conferences? And of course... The reason is it's a greenhouse gas and even though it takes up only a tiny portion of the Earth's atmosphere, it has a huge potency. So it traps shortwave radiation from escaping the Earth's atmosphere and in effect it acts like a blanket, it warms the Earth. But we could ask, well, is it unnatural, is it a pollutant? And it, it is absolutely not a pollutant gas. Carbon dioxide is a natural part of the Earth system. It's a natural part of the carbon cycle. Carbon dioxide has varied throughout Earth history. So why is it that we're concerned about this molecule today? And the reason why is because today we are really entering uncharted waters, or I should say uncharted atmospheric composition. Although we know from studies of fossil plants and other fossil organisms and chemical signatures in the Earth's deep past, we know that carbon dioxide levels have been much higher than today in the past. However, what's really, really unprecedented about our current atmospheric situation is that the rate of change of carbon dioxide in the modern atmosphere in the last century has been faster than any known geological warming event in our in our entire history, and you could even go back 500 million years. So the rate of change is really unprecedented. And then we have to, again, think about the context of time. So if you consider the millions of organisms on planet Earth, a very large proportion of those species have only evolved within the last 15 million years. So for a very large portion of planet Earth species, they have never experienced such high carbon dioxide levels. So the question as scientists, um, as community members, is well, what is the consequence of changing carbon dioxide levels? What is the consequence for our climate system? What is the consequence for biological organisms? And as we, as we continue burning fossil fuels and we continue land use change from forest to cropland, carbon dioxide levels will double by the end of this century. So what are the biological consequences of this experiment we're doing with the atmosphere at such a rapid rate? And one way that we can try and address this complex question is to look back in the geological past. So there have been times in Earth history when the Earth was much warmer than today, and there have been natural global warming events in Earth history. So part of my research and, and, and my team uh, of researchers, what we do is we try and look at what are the biological consequences and the climatic consequences of past um, atmospheric events. And we try and learn from those to say something about what's happening in the future. I'm a paleobotanist. I love fossil plants. I study fossil plants. So our tool for addressing these complex questions is to look back 
at the fossil plant record. Now, fossil plants are incredible things. Um, a, a plant is intimately adapted to its environment. So the toothiness of a leaf will give you an indication of the mean annual temperature in which that leaf developed. The, the untoothiness of a leaf will give you an indication of the precipitation that was around at the time the leaf developed. If you look at the number of stomata, the breathing pores on the leaf surface, it gives you an indication of the CO2 concentration in which that leaf developed. So by looking at the shape, the structure, the anatomy, morphology, chemistry of ancient leaves, we can address, well, what are the biological consequences of past atmospheric events? So really what, what I want to do is take you on, on a journey of big geological steps back in time and just look at some of these consequences that we've learned about in our research. So the first step is 50 million years ago and it is a starkly different world than today. The most obvious object that is missing is that there's no ice at the poles. So 50 million years ago the world was completely ice free. If we look at the coasts of Ireland, the coasts of France and um, the UK, they were fringed by subtropical mangrove swamps. Forests of dawn redwood fringed the Arctic Ocean and the Transantarctic Mountains were covered in southern beech, species you find today in Australia. Um, the Arctic Ocean itself was pond-like, it was capped by fresh water and because there was fresh water present it was teeming with uh, terrestrial or water-loving fern, marsilia. Looking at the Irish coastline, it was fringed by this subtropical mangrove swamp. And we know from fossil plant studies that the carbon dioxide concentration of the Eocene atmosphere is 1,000 parts per million. By the end of this century, our worst case scenario is that we're going to reach 1,000 parts per million. Certainly by the, the beginning of the next century, this is what we're going to reach. If we look back 95 million years ago, the age of the dinosaurs, we looked at fossils from Utah, looked at the number of stomata on the leaf surface, and discovered that a mere 600 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere can contribute to a complex set of um, processes that results in world oceans becoming anoxic. And anoxic oceans have consequences for the biological organisms that dwell in the marine system. Anoxic waters re result in extinction of different marine organisms. Now, stepping further back in time to 200 million years ago, and this is a time close to my heart because I've spent so much time researching this interval. It's the boundary between the Triassic and the Jurassic periods in Earth history. It was the age of the dawn of the dinosaurs. And by simply observing how the shape and structure and chemistry of the plants that existed across this interval have changed, we can address well, what happens if you push the Earth system to higher carbon dioxide concentrations? What happens to climate? And what happens to the biological organisms that live on the Earth? All of the fossils from this time interval we've studied come from modern-day Arctic East Greenland. So this is 72 degrees north. It's within the Arctic Circle. It's treeless. And there's only one month of the year it doesn't snow. Um, looking back at the fossils, what we see is a picture of lush subtropical forests. It was much warmer than today. Um, the carbon dioxide levels and global temperatures were much warmer. They were about three times higher than today. But this is a time of a natural global warming event driven by volcanism. And we can actually learn by tracking the fossil responses what happens if you push a system beyond a threshold. So if you push this system beyond a threshold, if you increase carbon dioxide levels by 500 parts per million, we begin to see instability in the system. We begin to see species going extinct. Um, we begin to see new species arriving. We begin to see a change in the composition of the vegetation. Um, the, the organisms which are generalists tend to prevail. This is what we'd expect. Whereas the organisms that are in any way specialist in their biology, these are the organisms that suffer greater extinction. You go one step further, you increase it by 1,100 parts per million, 
and we begin to see a complete ecosystem collapse. 85% of species that were living in East Greenland at the time go extinct. And, but many of the lineages to which they belong, nearly all of them survive. So as well as seeing this major ecological change, we also this, see this incredible resilience in biological systems. Some species go extinct, but their cousins evolve. They're slightly different morphologically, chemically than their cousins, but they belong to the same lineages. Then at the peak of the high carbon dioxide atmosphere and the peak warmth, we, following the ecosystem collapse, within a few million years, we see new ecosystems emerge. The dwellers of these ecosystems are the generalists. So ferns are extremely happy and they're diverse. Woody species are preferentially go extinct. And I think what, what's one of the most interesting um, aspects of our findings is that some of the consequences of global warming and some of the consequences of atmospheric change are predictable. So warm loving species push, push further towards the poles and they squeeze out the cold adaptive species. This is predictable. But some of our findings are highly unpredictable. And this is why it's so complex predicting future biological response to climate change. One of the most unexpected findings is that we see a huge increase in the prevalence of fire in these ecosystems. So the fire intensity and the fire frequency increases fivefold. And the reason is a very subtle biological adaptation of the vegetation made it simply more flammable, more able to propagate fire. So if you look in, in the cooler world of the late Triassic, the leaves were pretty much entire. And as the climates got warmer, the leaves became more dissected. And if you dissect a body, you enable more efficient cooling from that body. So the plants were adapting to the new prevailing climate by becoming more dissected. They were able to cool more efficiently and protect their genetic machinery, the DNA, which is very temperature sensitive. But an inadvertent consequence of this ad adaptation was that more dissected leaves are more flammable. Our experiments show they burn hotter, faster, and give off more volatiles. So here's a, an adaptation to a change in carbon dioxide and a change in climate, which had an unexpected consequence for fire ecology. Within another few million years, carbon dioxide levels dropped back to their pre-excursion levels. Global temperatures came back down to what they had been. And the reason is that geological processes checked a runaway greenhouse. So they pulled carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and brought carbon dioxide back to pre-excursion levels and cooled global climate. And new ecosystems formed. They were stable. They were highly diverse. However, the big distinction is that the key players, the dominance in these new ecosystems were completely different from the former ecosystems. So the former dominance became rare and the former rare species became the dominance. So you see a complete ecological shift. Um, so the, the players were totally different. So the main lessons we've learned from this research is that the atmosphere and the atmospheric composition is just one of four interacting processes within the Earth system. You've got the atmosphere, the biosphere, which is all living organisms, the lithosphere, which is rocks, and the hydrosphere, which is oceans and sea. And if you perturb one aspect of that system, you will have a knock-on effect on all other parts of the Earth system. And there is if you perturb the system, you get unexpected consequences, like increasing fire ecology, and you get expected consequences, squeezing out the cold species and increasing the prevalence and the geographical range of the warm-loving species. And really, what we've learned is there's really only one certainty, is that within a few million years, the whole system comes back to a steady state. So the Earth system has got all of these checks and balances which will bring it back to where it was before. But I'm going back to time scale again. If we consider the human time scale of a life, that's, let's hope, 80 years, give or take, 
if we consider even the, the time scale of a species, most species last for about two to three million years. There's some unusual exceptions, but give or take two to three million years. It's certain that geological processes will bring a system back to a new steady state. But I suppose I'm asking, do we have, we, we certainly don't have the luxury of geological time to solve this century's environmental issues. And if we consider the livelihoods of our children and our grandchildren, and even more importantly, the livelihoods and the environment of the vulnerable people on this planet, do we really want to push our climate system past another threshold before we collectively take action and try and stop um, our current Earth system from pushing into an Eocene of 50 million years ago or a 95 million years ago climate um, system. Thank you very much. <laughs>